Welcome back to the Inglit Hit. Given our series in Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley is over, I'm now going to upload my full selection of thoughts on Ozymandias the poem as a whole. In the video description, I've included the transcript of everything I've said during these videos, and so it might be a good idea to read along while you're listening. So, over the course of this video, we're going to look at a number of things. We're going to start with a reading of the poem and an introduction. Then we're going to look at the following things. Impermanent influence, fragmented fusion, shattered structure, symbolic sound, sculptor's satire, degraded dictator, arrogant autocrat, and eternal emptiness. First then, an introduction and a reading of the poem. Diodorus Sicilus, in his Bibliotheca Historica, records the inscription at the bottom of the statue of Ozymandias, or Ramesses II. King of kings am I, Ozymandias. If anyone would know how great I am and where I lie, let him surpass one of my works. These are the words of an infantile dictator, farcically set on consolidating his legacy for all of time. But it is the reality, the ephemerality of his power and influence, that remains in Shelley's artistic expression. Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that it sculpt a well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. First then, we're going to focus on line one and an impermanent influence. Ozymandias is a poem that showcases how even the mightiest despots are annihilated by time. Omnipotent figures are reduced to ruined statues. This is the inevitable fate of the powerful, according to Shelley. The short vowel sound, a, ah, recurs throughout the poem as a whole, and here the assonance immediately resonates. I met a traveller from an antique land. It is a short, cutting sound, and its brevity echoes the transience of the great empires Shelley sought to depict. It is vitally important that the perspective changes in the first line from the first-person pronoun I to the traveller and his retelling of his experiences. We are immediately twice removed from the subject of the work, Ozymandias, and later in line six we will see that we are a third time removed as the sculptor who crafted the statue is introduced. And later still, in line 10, we are a fourth time detached with the introduction of the king himself, Ozymandias. William Bash says, The finished poem relies on a number of reconstructions. The sculptor constructed Ozymandias. The traveller constructed the body of the king lost in the sand. The poet constructed or organised or presented a pattern for us. Can you see how these stages challenge the level of tangibility? So the perspective shift at the beginning serves as a structural message. The diminished credibility of the account is itself an indication of Ozymandias' legacy and fate, i.e. one that will become obscured with time. The mysterious traveller from an antique land is the subject of much debate. Shelley never saw the statue himself, and it is speculated that he may have consulted a London periodical called The Traveller. Regardless, the name is vague. This opening is devoid of orientation. In its implicit brilliance, the reader is afforded no precise time or place. In fact, this first line is bare, both in its sound and its language. The taut linguistic construction in the poem as a whole beautifully implies a moral undertone, but by no means enforces its didactic message. Could Shelley be suggesting that his artistic power is greater than that of a powerful tyrant who explicitly commands, look on my works. The vagueness of the speaker's persona, and indeed the traveller he meets, 
is largely irrelevant in understanding the central irony of the poem that Ozymandias' inscription is laughably different to the shattered visage that now remains. But there exists a structural juxtaposition that will form the basis of the poem, and it is grounded here in the relationship between the I, who I think should not be assumed as Shelley, and the traveller, who imparts some wisdom, the remainder of the poem. The sculptor who obeys the cold command to immortalise Ozymandias imparts his wisdom in teaching the king a lesson. Ramesses II does ultimately end up as a colossal wreck. Are we to assume then that the traveller is using this story as a means of teaching this speaker, perhaps a young, vain proponent of the Western Industrial Revolution, a lesson? Shelley was, after all, a radical political activist, opposed to the injustices of capitalism. Secondly, let's have a look at the fragmented fusion of the poem. Lauded for its subtleties in syntax and diction, Ozymandias is a poem in which grandiosity is seamlessly fused with absurdity. The fragmentation of majestic facade is laid bare, and the line between ephemerality and permanence is hazy. It's central irony that even the mightiest tyrants, despair, fade in the passage of time, boundless and bare, is reflected in its syntax, that's word arrangement, and diction, word choice. William Friedman said this, The fragmented construction is doubtless a verbal replication of the fractured statue it describes. We see this in the temporal delays enforced by the poem's broken syntax, the punctuated pause of Caesura on this line, who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone. And crucially, where enjambment is often used in poems to create a sense of flow and momentum, here instead it stunts the progress of the narrative. Much like the statue stuck, stock still in a desert, shattered, the sentence is left incomplete, a stark contrast to the grandiosity it purported by the pharaoh Ozymandias, king of kings. The alliterative power of the words in their repetition of the st sound into the subsequent line, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, acts as a stutter in reiterating the faux stature of the pharaoh. Immediately, because of the enjambment, Shelley has insisted on an ironic interpretation of the subsequent line. The stand in the desert is not to be taken seriously, rather viewed as the deluded assertion of a naive dictator that his legacy will last the petty demands of an infantile brat. This is a line that cries of fragmented grandeur. In its pitiful construction, literally and poetically, we are left wondering whether this is a depressing verdict on the transience of human power, or a self-deprecating joke. The adjective vast sets up a paradoxical ambiguity in this first description of the statue. Its seemingly immense influence is showcased here at the beginning, and then followed by Shelley's clever irony in coupling trunkless with legs, which sounds like a contradiction, though it's not strictly oxymoronic, because trunkless refers to the absence of the upper body. The plurality of legs is purposefully disingenuous. They do not stand in the conventional sense, because they are separated in animate blocks of stone, and not, as Ozymandias possibly thought, an eternal continuation of his legacy. Shelley playfully undermines the perpetuation of human power by emphasising the ephemerality of its remnants. After all, it is only the head and the legs described. The torso is not there, and we see it throughout the poem. John Leonard said this, Lifeless and boundless join trunkless in a lexical set, restraining the vigorous reverence with which Shelley reanimates fragmented majesty. Thirdly, let's have a look at line three and four, and shattered structure and symbolic sand. Why is it important that the shattered visage and legs of stone stand in a desert? It is the setting that is so integral in applying moral weight to the poem. Stephen Hebron in his article for the British Library says this, The poem does not end with a moral truism, but with the simple striking image of the desert sands. The sand is an arresting image of the passage of time. One thinks of an hourglass. However, it is also transitory. 
It moves about the place in the slightest of breezes, and there's no controlling its spread. Shelley is purposefully implicit, both in style and content, a subtlety that hints that art is less transient, perhaps more permanent, than dictatorships and empires. Yet, as we've already established, even the poem is fragmented and displaced, not only in terms of diction and syntax, but also with regard to its form. It is a sonnet, but not a conventional one. Ozymandias is an unconventional sonnet on three levels. It is a sonnet in the sense that it is a 14-line poem and metred in iambic pentameter. But firstly, this metre is not wholly consistent. Shelley disrupts the rhythm in lines 11 and 12. Secondly, the rhyme scheme is unusual. It links the first half of the poem, an octave, with the second, sestet, by gradually replacing rhymes with new ones, rather than following the traditional structure. We're left with a fragmented rhyme scheme that departs from convention, a, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, E, D, E, F, E, F. Finally, while a Shakespearean sonnet might usually end with a rhyming couplet, this one does not. It seems Shelley could be distorting the ordinary in order to defy the establishment. Nothing human is everlasting, after all. The ah sound running through these two lines, which is prominent throughout the poem as a whole, reminds us of the distant origins of a thought. Stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk or shattered. We can audibly gauge a unity between concepts, a cohesion that carries throughout. But crucially, it is a vague cohesion, and almost like the level sand stretching far away, we are led to see the statue, and possibly the poem itself, as fleeting. It could be said that Ramesses II, or Ozymandias, is stuck, half sunk as he is, absorbed by the millions of grains of sand that envelop him. But I like the image of him floating away, a vague memory caught in an eddy of wind and rushed on, exiled from popular culture in any meaningful sense. Either interpretation leads us back to the idea of the ephemerality of human power, whether imperial, to do with empires, or artistic, to do with poems and art. The facade of stability is coupled with the brutal reality. Line three begins with stand and ends with sand. Two words that rhyme, they look and sound very similar, and yet they almost summarise the fate of Ozymandias. In Ecclesiastes in the Bible, the writer speaks of the meaninglessness of this life in comparison to the eternal life offered through Jesus. All go to the same place, all come from dust, and to dust all return. Here, Shelley's deliberate use of the word stand, he knows that it is a superficial stand, is satirical and self-deprecative when the same line closes with the word sand. This harks at the conservative 2017 election promise of strong and stable government and the satirist's reply of weak and wobbly reality. Instead, here, Shelley crafts both in order to make a point about the inevitable diminishing of human power over the course of time. We are led to think this anyway, because the caesura, the ellipsis, or full stop, depending on which edition you've got, cuts us short from the security of the stand in the desert, while the continuing enjambment, cutting short each line, reiterates the idea of stagnation and fragmentation. In line four, this juxtaposition is exemplified by the visual representation of a half-sunk face. It's ironic that the ruler has insisted on the inscription, look on my works, when the statue, if statues could be said to look, is blind or at least visually impaired. As mentioned previously, the continued ah sound through to shattered half echoes of the fragmentation in the form of the statue, and indeed of the poem itself. We see this too in the description of the statue's face. Frown, shattered and wrinkled speak of a contorted face, one frozen in time. I will comment on this in more detail, uh, in my analysis of line five, but it's important to note that the expression is static, frozen in time. The message it gives is established, its meaning irredeemable, set to be interpreted in whichever way we choose. Ultimately, Ozymandias the king has lost control, while the recipient or reader of this poem, us, we're left to determine his fate. His hubris, a Greek word for arrogance, is laid bare. And, as this analysis has already proven, the history books do not look on him favourably. OK, next we're going to look at lines 5 and 6. 
a sculptor's satire. If any line in the poem encapsulates that sense of radical anti-establishment politics that Shelley was such a keen proponent of, it is this, and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Paul Foote, an investigative journalist and long-time member of the Socialist Workers' Party, called him Red Shelley, and tracked links between Shelley's political poems and the rise of Marxism in the 19th century. Karl Marx himself was said to have drawn inspiration from them. Here, Ozymandias' hubris is exposed. His arrogance, and later his defiance of other leaders or even gods, look on my works, ye mighty and despair, is captured in a facial expression that seems almost satirical. Think spitting image puppets of Margaret Thatcher and Michael Foote. Think the cartoonist's exaggerated impression of Donald Trump. There is an underlying irony here, though. The haughty personality with which we are presented could not have been the pharaoh's intended outcome. Rather, it is the sculptor who has made a mockery of his master. The roles have been reversed, and the sculptor exploits Ozymandias' naivety in order to satirise and ridicule him. It is ironic, therefore, that what does yet survive among the decay of that colossal wreck is a facial expression that epitomises Ozymandias' false confidence and conceit. The cruelty of autocratic regimes, the glory of extensive civilizations, the pride of victorious leaders will cease. Their influence will diminish. They will fall. This is the pattern of Marxism. As Karl Marx put it, what the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all are its own gravediggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Mr Burling represents that same broad class of people. While he's not a ruler like Ozymandias, his downfall is marked by his inability to see sense, pursuing his egotistical ambition at the expense of the working class. Mr Burling is his own gravedigger. Ozymandias is his own gravedigger. It is important to note once again that Shelley is implicit in his expression, and so the onus is on the reader to interpret the ruler, who is depicted first by the sculptor, second by the traveller, and third by the speaker. We should recognise that as fourth-hand recipients, bias muddies our view of things. And whilst on one hand this reinforces the fact that human power, Ozymandias' power, is ephemeral, this also leads us to consider how perceptions can be distorted over time. However hard one tries to create one's own legacy, history has a way of making a colossal wreck of this. It is clear that Ozymandias was a repugnant figure, and this is reflected in both the language and the sound of the line. The plosives that carry through the line, and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command, is audibly cutting and almost sounds like an obscenity. The repetition of and makes this seem like a never-ending list. He is a reprehensible character, and it is all captured in this fragmented statue. While his kingdom perishes, his arrogant persona persists, for now, in this humiliating state. The synesthesia, the merging of more than one sense, of cold command, fuses the temperature cold with what is audible, command. We're reminded of Dickens' description of Scrooge. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. This word cold is not often used in a positive light. So we see in these two lines Ozymandias' fate confined to a sculptor's impression of him, the sculptor not even being one of the mighty the pharaoh scorns, but a lowly servant instead. Is Shelley the sculptor? Is his statue, this poem, a lasting elegy, a radical statement that will transcend the power and influence of political empires? Or should it, too, resign itself to an inevitable demise, lost amid the GCSE poetry anthologies, and one day left to gather dust on the upper shelf of a neglected cupboard? Next, we're going to look at lines 7 to 8, thinking about the degraded dictator. Ozymandias' passions are stamped on these lifeless blocks of stone. It is telling that his wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command are what survive, even amid this colossal wreck. At this halfway point in the poem, the central irony that Ozymandias craves an eternal legacy of his works, and yet this work, the statue, is crumbling before our very eyes, is set up properly. The dictionary definition of satire is the use of humour, irony, exaggeration or ridicule to expose and criticise people's stupidity or vices. And 
Ozymandias, this ruthless dictator, certainly has vices. Percy Bysshe Shelley was a notorious satirist. In his poem The Mask of Anarchy, he refers to Castlereagh, the foreign secretary at the time, as murder. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Shelley, in this third-hand account, accentuates the satire of Ozymandias, this repugnant ruler, by demonstrating that his legacy is nothing but a shattered visage and an accompanying reminder of his arrogance. Even when we might expect an analysis of Ozymandias to have been distorted, we are assured that our impression of the pharaoh is the same as that which the sculptor read. While the account of the physical statue is unreliable, mimicked in Shelley's fragmented choice of structure, there is a degree of certainty in how the sculptor stamped his opinions of Ozymandias into stone. But it is Shelley's clever description of the stone itself as lifeless things that emphasises Ozymandias' position in time. He is not the king of kings. In fact, this is a startling rebuke. He is anything but alive. The ambiguity of it heightens that sense of insignificance. Forget the glory and splendour of an extravagant king. These are merely things. Notice the juxtaposition in the line. While his reputation and undesirable qualities survive, the statue he commissioned is lifeless. This is not the statue he anticipated it would be. His cold command has backfired, and here he is exposed as a humiliated king in his time, and an even more humiliated king in our time. In his time, the sculptor depicted him in such a way that others might scorn at his malevolence, and in our time, Shelley has set up an unreliable third-hand account of a ruined statue in an empty desert. The stark contrast between Ozymandias' intentions, his optimism, and the brutal reality, the ephemerality of human power, is laid bare. It is important to consider the crucial role the sculptor plays in making a farce of his master. The humiliation of Ozymandias is something that Shelley expounds in using what's called syntactic parallelism. This is when the arrangement of words in two or more sentences or phrases correspond to one another. For instance, her dog chased and his cat ran. The pronoun, noun, verb structure is repeated to create a sense of implication. The antecedent causes the effect. In the same way, the hand that mocked follows the arrangement of article, noun, pronoun, verb, and likewise the heart that fed. The antecedent, namely the mocking, causes Ozymandias' heart to feed. It's worth noting at this point that the word mocked is ambiguous. Mocking can either mean to create an imitation of something or to ridicule something. It's more likely that its literal meaning denotes the sculptor's act in crafting the statue out of these lifeless things, while Ozymandias laps up the opportunity of glorification and exaltation, the heart that fed. You can almost imagine him sitting there, can't you? The subject of a new statue, his sense of entitlement, his self-orientated desire. In the words of Robert Browning's narrator in My Last Duchess, it's clear that it's all for me. And crucially, this is what makes his downfall that much worse. The personified heart, gratifying its selfish instincts, believes wholeheartedly that this statue will be an eternal reminder for the mighty to despair how wrong he is. It is the double meaning of mocked that expounds perfectly the sculptor's power over his master. In the poem Ozymandias, the roles have been reversed, and much like Shelley himself in his political activism, the artisan has degraded the dictator. Next, in the penultimate section, we're going to look at lines 9 to 11, at the arrogant autocrat. In 2004, when Jose Mourinho arrived at Chelsea to take up a new managerial role at the football club, he said these words, Please do not call me arrogant, because what I'm saying is true. I'm European champion, so I'm not one out of the bottle. I think I'm a special one. You might be forgiven for thinking Mourinho channelled the spirit of Ozymandias in this infamous declaration of self-confidence. In the same way as Ozymandias, Mourinho's career, full of successes with Porto and Chelsea and Real Madrid, has been marred by recent failures with other clubs. Like all extensive empires, Mourinho's too is beginning to diminish. Shelley's Ozymandias is a poem for modern times as well as old. His message that human power is transient and fleeting is one that transcends the subject of the poem 
and is immediately applicable to any arrogant autocrat. Think Saddam Hussein, the vicious Iraqi dictator. He was convicted of crimes against humanity in 2006, but in 2003 a statue that was erected in his honour was destroyed by furious protesting citizens who subsequently decapitated it. In the 21st century AD, in the 13th century BCE, absolutist power corrupts the individual, and as Shelley has depicted in his poem, time will have its way with us, and before that, the satirist, the protester, the mocker, well, they'll give it a bloody good go too. We see Mourinho's self-assurance in Ozymandias' own declaration. Both use a first-person pronoun, I'm European champion, and my name, to make it absolutely clear that this is a statement about them and nobody else. Both command their listeners with imperative verbs, do not call me arrogant, and look on my works. Both award themselves titles, I'm a special one, and king of kings. While Mourinho's pride was certainly startling, Ozymandias' haughtiness in attributing to himself the godly title that is so prevalent in the Bible is incomparably staggering, particularly when the reader benefits from knowing that this tyrant is in fact a shattered visage. Shelley does not want us to despair, he wants us to laugh. However, is there a case for arguing that the poem is meant to scare us in its astonishing irony? This antique traveller feels the need to recount his experiences in the desert. Why? Not to make us laugh at a dictator we never knew, but because this colossal wreck is a striking image of human mortality. Time gives way to an emptiness, not just for dictators and tyrants, but for ordinary people too. If Ozymandias' fate is one of eternal humiliation, a tarnished and fragmented legacy, then what hope does this traveller have, or indeed the eye at the beginning? Shelley's poem is a cutting rebuke of the overconfident. In the final lines, we'll see how humanity and its man-made empires are nothing on the power of nature. Perhaps this is Shelley's own call to look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Finally then, lines 12 to 14, and eternal emptiness. Earlier in this talk, I said this of the statue in the desert. It could be said that Ramesses II, or Ozymandias, is stuck, half sunk as he is, absorbed by the millions of grains of sand that envelop him. But I like the image of him floating away, a vague memory caught in an eddy of wind, and rushed on, exiled from popular culture in any meaningful sense. It is this ending that really highlights Ozymandias' fate. The sheer desolation in place of a vast empire. The fact that nothing beside remains of this self-professed king of kings. The eternal emptiness of the lone and level sands. This setting is a vacuum into which no human power can possibly penetrate. Nature has had its way. The language of sparsity is clear. Nothing. Bare. Lone. This boundless or infinite wasteland is Ozymandias' cemetery. His legacy left to rot round the decay. Shelley has made much of the tyrant's former powers, his vast legs, and now this colossal wreck, in order for his fall to have a greater impact. Humans crave attention. We desire recognition, reverence, and respect. We cherish our reputations. But Shelley crafts a rather bleak image of the extent of that recognition, reverence and respect. Ozymandias, once surrounded by advisers, servants, soldiers, even sculptors, is now completely and utterly alone. His statue, once a centred masterpiece in his grand city, designed to intimidate his subjects, is left discarded in the desert. Nothing beside remains. This is a shocking sentence that cuts to the heart of human pride and its inevitable implications. This lacerated line of poetry, the caesura slicing it in half, is a rebuke of absolutist power. But it is not just Ozymandias, the malevolent despot who will crumble, his empire diminished. It is the sculptor's work of art, 
the traveller's unreliable story, the speaker's even more unreliable recitation, and, at some point, even Shelley's poem too. This is, after all, in terms of both imperial power and artistic power, an admission of his own ephemerality, the fleetingness of his own work. This is a poem of decay.